Okay, I'll get uh, our CSDMS, the Community Service Dynamics Modeling System webinar series um, of today going. Um, um, so I'm uh, Irina Overeem and I'm on the like CSDMS integration facility and we're hosting together with Sam Harrison, like as a hybrid US um, European. So I'll like hand in a second the, the um, mic to him um but i'm like very delighted to like have uh guillaume jouvet um present today um because he was like one of the first people that for me personally um um introduced me to the world of like neural nets in like modeling and like not in just data manipulation or image manipulation but like really like taking that tool or those methods to like physics-based modeling and physics-informed machine learning um, and uh, all the better that it was in a glacial logical model and like we'll hear some about glacial uh, dynamics as well. So I'll hand it over to Sam who like talks a bit on like the Euro CSDMS. Yeah, thanks very much. So uh, I guess some of you might have spotted that, that um, this the full webinar series this year We've been running two of them as a as what we've labeled the Euro CSDMS webinar, um, and basically the goal there is is to align the the topics and align the time zones slightly more favorably towards Europe. Um, and actually, this is based on a little bit of funding that I've got at my institute, and I'll say who I am in a sec, um, which is hoping to kind of bring together different communities so we have a little bit of a community over here so I'm based at UKCH UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology um, where I'm based up in Lancaster in the UK uh, and we have a, a community up here called SEEDS which is a Centre of Excellence in Environmental Data Science um, which is a joint institute between um, UKCH and Lancaster University um, and we do basically lots of similar work to what CSDMS does um, and we thought this was a really good opportunity to kind of I, I don't want to use a buzzword synergism but I'm going to use it anyway um, to bring out some synergies by you know working a bit closely together so cut a long story short we, we've got a couple of these webinars this um, this time round that we as I say targeting slightly more at the euro side of stuff um, and I also just wanted to flag that at the end of next year, we're going to be holding um, a Eurosystems, Euro CSDMS workshop um, over in the northwest of the UK. Um, and we're really bring, hoping to bring some, some folks there from the European community together. Um, it's going to be a, a workshop with seminars, with tutorial type stuff, maybe with some kind of interactive sessions. Um, the scope hasn't been fully decided yet, as, as you can imagine. Um, but I think one of the themes is going to be around what what the next generation of environmental modeling will look like and, and what are the tools and what are the things that can that can bring us there. Um, and that's a really nice segue, actually, into Guillaume's talk today, because um, reading through his abstract, there's stuff in there that I think is absolutely part of that next generation of environmental modeling. We're talking about emulators and neural networks and GPU stuff. Um, so I'm really excited to have him here today talking about those things. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Guillaume. Um, do you want to get your slides up and check we're all OK? Yes. Perfect. Thanks so yeah, so over to you. And then and then we'll um, we'll wrap up at the end with some questions. Mm -hmm. So be thinking the questions on the way through. Cheers, over to you. Oh, thanks a lot. Uh, well, first of all, thanks a lot, uh, Sam, Lin, and Irina for organizing this. I'm very uh, happy and very honored to uh, to do this presentation for the CSDMS community that I'm following with very great interest. Um, okay, so. Uh, Basically, so I'm Guillaume Jouvet, I'm a professor, so substitute professor at University of Lausanne. And um, since two, three years, I think three years, I started to work on the Glacier Evolution Model, IGM, which is named after Instructed Glacier Model because uh, it is referring to deep learning. And I'm using basically deep learning mostly for boosting uh, or to make the um, to make the model computationally more efficient, but it has also some other advantages. Um, basically, I'm going to present my 
uh, talk uh, with the following structures. I'm first of all going to do some a bit of background on glacier evolution model and some rationale, what are the main limitations of today's model and why we, we would like to take some new new approaches. Then I'm going to detail, uh, to, to go more into the, to the detail about this emulation strategy for ice flow modeling, which is really the core of IHGM. Um, I'm going to talk about the inverse modeling because this is really a very important area also in glacier modeling it's all it has all to do with data assimilation and how to how we can integrate not only the physics but also the, the data uh, within this framework and then at some point i would like to make a short demo of igm according to the time that i have um, because actually we the goal is we can uh, select a glacier uh, randomly, and then we, we can make a short uh, 100 or 200 years of simulation of a glacier. So if anyone actually lis listening here has a glacier that he or she very like, then don't think about it. And then you may uh, give the RGI, you know, all glaciers, they have an ID. And if you can copy paste this RGI number in the chat, then I we will model uh, that glacier at the very end. Okay, let's start. Um, Okay, let's go to the basically the, the main picture of the glacier evolution model. So, uh, glacier evolution model take uh, his two basically two different components. On the other hand, on the one hand, we have some exchange with uh, the climate and how this translates into some surface mass balance, which can be positive on the top of a glacier or negative on the bottom. And on the other hand, we have a nice flow which bring which drain ice from uh, the top to the bottom. And basically, a glacier evolution model is modeling ice thickness evolution, uh, accounting for ice flow and surface mass balance through the mass conservation equations. And there are a couple of things we can add uh, to our model, whether we want to model thermodynamics, subglacial hydrology, calving, whatever. So this is really the main the main pictures. And the animation was just an example of uh, of an evolution of uh, the Alec glacier in Switzerland, but it was just an evolution of a glacier. They were not much uh, important things. Uh, the rationale for uh, building a new glacier, well, at least a new approach to have a new approach for uh, glacier evolution model is that there is obviously an increasing demand in glacier evolution model with more physics. We would like to have more higher resolution or uh, explore longer time scale, especially if we want to do some paleo glacier modeling. And there is something that uh, often happen in model is that it's if we think about, for instance, um, paleo glacier models, it's often that we we actually simulate several uh, same or similar states. So if we think about a glacier which during the glacier last glacial cycle advanced fifty times and then retreated for fifty times, in fact, we could think about that we we are recomputing many times the same thing, which bring us to the idea that uh, would that not be able would that be a, a way to instead of resolving and then re um, investing time investing computational time uh, trying to remember or trying to store the information we already computed and then reuse it um, and of course a major thing is that uh, parallel computing is key to achieve significant speed up especially gpus because now the computational world is migrating towards gpus just for um, uh, um, small illustration. So CPU, we can say this as we have uh, six very, very fast cores, but we only have a few of them. Uh, and that's not much if we want to, especially to deal with some very large grids, uh, because everything has to go through these six, even if they are large uh, pipes. On the other hand, a GPU, it's a lot of, of processors, but they are, they are much lower. So we can sort of uh, picture the difference between CPU and GPU that way. And the thing is that in the last year, there were uh, impressive uh, improvements in GPU. They are cheap, they are affordable because they are also used by the gaming community. And they are they made tremendous uh, improvement in terms of uh, number of cores, uh, power, and then the, 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 the computational capability of GPUs is, uh, has reached a, a level which is pretty impressive. And it's also increasing very quickly, which means that everything that we are developing on GPU, uh, you can expect to have for the same code um, in two years, probably a speed up of possibly a factor two, while you won't gain much on CPU. Um, I do have an animation, but I'm not daring to <laughs> open it here, uh, just to show, I don't know, should I try or not? Uh, let's try. 
yeah, it doesn't crash. Nice. <laughs> I just had a drop of, uh, on my front. It's OK. So just uh, an example of uh, it's basically a game where I use the topography of the Alps and just playing the game of decreasing and, and increasing the, the equilibrium line altitude and just having glaciers that uh, grow and uh, go forward and go backward. Just to mention that it's a 1,000 year simulation, so it doesn't intend to reproduce any kind of reality. It's just an exercise, basically. But this is something that took uh, about an hour on, on the laptop of the GPU of the my laptop. And here is just an example of, basically, I played the game of doing some settings, which means that I additionally included some uh, particles, just tracking passively particles. Uh, so it's just some post-processing, but it's also a big advantage of uh, using the GPU because then uh, all the computation of each individual particles can be done in parallel, so that we can afford really doing uh, millions and millions of particles. And again, what all what am I going to all what am I showing to you is really it's not super high computing. It's uh, it was done on a on, a, on on the GPU of a good laptop. But basically, uh, it's it's really something which is key is that we that um, if we are capable, basically, to go to to turn our computation to the GPU, we can really afford doing or uh, handling some very large arrays and possibly to uh, capture very high resolution if this if that's what we want. Uh, the main problem is that how to vectorize or how to parallelize all the operation of a glacial evolution model and keeping the modeling framework simple. And all my presentation, all this um, this glacial evolution model IGM is about this. Okay, if we think about um, um, the simulation I've been showing to you before, where basically we have different components. We have surface mass band, we have the interaction from climate to the glacier, we have the mass conservation, and then we have the ice dynamic. Uh, the ice flow modeling is, is usually the computation of bottlenecks. This is what takes in a uh, high order model, this is what takes uh, 95, if not 99% of the time. So which means that if we want to reduce the bottlenecks, this is, a com this, is the component we have to, 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 to attack first. And this is all the strategy of IGM is to, instead of uh, solving uh, the partial differential equation associated with the ice flow, instead to emulate this part, and instead to replace the traditional solver by a machine learning model, which is here a convolutional neural network trained from high order models. And the, the main advantage is that once this is trained, the, uh, it is computationally very efficient. And on the top of that, it, it runs on GPU very well, because those all those, not net, those neural networks uh, are extremely compatible with GPU computation in a sense that GPU can uh, not only train them, but evaluate them very efficiently on GPUs, because you can, uh, there is a, the, 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 the strategy for parallelizing is really the base of actually the, the uh, of the neural networks. So this is all what uh, what is going to what I'm going to do is really to to substitute this part by a convolutional neural, net, neural network. So the idea is to use this deep learning surrogate model. So instead of uh, solving the physical model, so here would be the Stokes Stokes equations that are modeling the dynamic of the eye. So this is one, one uh, possibility. It's not the only model. There are some simplification of this model, but this is usually the one that we like because this is, uh, it, it has, it is complete in terms of the mechanical component it has on. Uh, so the idea is that instead of uh, using this model, we, are, we want to go for the other way, which is using this deep learning surrogate model, which is our convolutional neural network. So we really want to go that way. And the main challenge is that how to train basically a convolutional neural network to do what, uh, or to do possible, uh, not exactly what the, the physical model is going to do, but at least something very similar. So here, we aim to, to train a convolutional network, which basically will map uh, output field. What we want to uh, predict is ice flow velocity. So this is uh, something that we want to do on the raster grid. So you can think this is a horizontal um, component, the horizontal directions, and the layers uh, correspond to the, to the third dimension, basically the, the, the vertical elevation. And we want to 
to do this from input fields, which include, for instance, the eye thickness or the surface of the topography. There are some parameters which are controlling the eye's viscosity or the sliding. Um, basically, here we put all our predictors, which are basically the parameters that are that would be in the Stokes solver if we were going towards the solver, but we are not doing this. So instead, we are we are using and we are stacking our inputs that way because uh, the main interest of working with uh, raster grid is that uh, first of all we want to use this convolutional this convolutional neural networks which work on raster grid and uh, that way we represent all our data on, on those raster grids and the convolutional neural network are very basic tool in um, machine learning apply especially for image analysis so all the all the for instance the uh, classification problems like is that a cat, is that a dog, uh, or there are a bunch of other examples in image analysis, image labeling, which are based on this convolutional neural network. And these convolutional, these convolutions, they are special operations which are good at tracking special patterns. And that's exactly what we like to use because in a way we want to uh, build a neural network which is solving a PDE. We want to replace or to substitute the solving of the PDE and the PDE is itself made of derivatives, which makes it makes sense that we want to include this convolutional operation, which in fact are supposed are here to learn uh, the special derivative of the PDE. So uh, the CNN, mathematically speaking, is nothing else as a sequence of composition of linear and nonlinear functions. And the linear functions, they are trainable in the sense that uh, they are weights, and those weights are that's what we are going to optimize to fit to some data. That's really the, the, the basics of, uh, of the usage of CNN. So when I started to do something like this uh, for applied to ice flow modeling, the, the, I took an approach which was very um, similar to, let's say, a database approach, where my the I really took a very pragmatic and very easy approach, which means that I what I did is that I first tried to produce a certain number of data. So which means I used a nice flow model, an externalized flow model, and I I have simulated a certain number of glaciers. Here you can see ten glaciers. That so those glaci glaci glaciers don't actually don't exist. I just took randomly some topographies and I apply some certain climate to just to produce some geometries, some plausible geometries of glaciers, and I really wanted to build a certain catalog to get some large glaciers, some thin, thick one, uh, fast, slow ice, a bit of everything. The goal is to get to, to get a certain diversity. And on the top of this, when I had my database, I tried to train this convolutional network to fit as much as possible to those data. So you could think about, you do some run, on with um, an external simulation tool. So here I used uh, Elmer Ice, Oh, and I actually did not use only AMR, I use also the parallel ice sheet model uh, to produce a certain number of data. And then I try to, I, I train my neural network, my conversational network to minimize the misfit to those data. So I tried, I feed, I fed this, this neural network with a lot of data with the goal of say, okay, this is a database, try to get as close as, to, uh, as, close as possible to the, model data that, that came out of those uh, ice flow model. So this was really the, the former approach, which was nice, but the problem is that uh, it did not generalize very well. So you could think that, of course, if you are modeling mountain glaciers, don't, don't expect it to work with, with ice sheet or ice shelf, because of course, this is another dimension. The ice flow is very different. Uh, it's going to work only if you are modeling something that resemble uh, what you have in your training data set. Uh, but still, in general, it provided it did a rather good job. But again, uh, as soon as we were going out of this um, envelope defined by the database, it, it was not uh, it was hardly generalizable. That's the reason I, I came to another approach, which is way more recent. The paper came this year, where basically the idea was instead of training the convolutional neural network to uh, fit some external data. So basically, I train it to minimize the energy which comes with the ice flow model. Because that's something that actually it's a common point to any ice flow model is that they can all be written in, in form of an energy. So here it's not the Stokes model, it's a so-called blatter patin model, which is a small simplification of uh, the Stokes. 
And um, what you can see here, so it's not the most common way to write the ice flow equation. So it's rather, uh, I would call a niche <laughs> to, to write it that way. But in fact, any ice flow model, what we don't always know is that when we have solvers that solve those PDEs, what they do actually, they are also optimizers that are minimizing this energy, even if this is not very visible. And so for instance, this energy which comes with the bladder pattern model is a sum of different terms. One corresponds to the shearing, one corresponds to, to the basal friction, and one corresponds to, to the gravity. Um, okay, sorry, I'll just close my emails not to be disturbed. Um, one corresponds to the gravity, and then this is basically we are minimizing a certain balance of, of forces. Um, I'm not going to go too much into the detail, but basically uh, the only difference using this physics-informed deep learning is that instead of minimizing the proximity to some data which was generated uh, a priori or externally offline, so this time we are just uh, training our neural network to minimize the energy which is associated with a physical system, uh, which makes that we have a generic approach, so which is way more uh, friendly for if we are treating any kind of ice flow, any kind of geometry, any kind of special resolution. And the most important data is, is we have a training which is completely glacier customized and supervised in the machine learning jargon, and it is done on the fly, which means that in fact, in our time loop, what we do is that any time step we use, I mean, we evaluate the emulator and then we retrain the emulator because we can. So we, you could think about this. When I say it's an emulator, it's something which is uh, capable to reproduce what the physical model we do, but only this and not more, and only for that glacier and not more and, and not for more. That's what I mean by emulator is that it is very efficient at doing what we are doing at times t, but don't expect it to be good to do something very different because we, and that's all the idea of having something which is really completely customized, but the thing is that we are retraining this on the fly, such that we are readapting the, 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 the weight uh, while we are actually computing. So we basically, we have this these two different steps. In each time step, we are training the CNN and then we are uh, evaluating the CNN. And it's a bit, it's a bit a trade-off whether how much we want to train how much we want. Well, we have to evaluate anyway, but the, the training is basically, this is a bit more expensive than the, evalu than the evaluation. So we are happy. So basically we want to train to be accurate, but we don't want to do it too much because it's expensive. So there is always a trade-off to have uh, in between. Um, it's efficient because we are kind of uh, taking advantage of all the automatic differentiation tool, um, that use actually the GPU and I'm using the TensorFlow library for, for doing, I mean, all of this is based on the TensorFlow library. And the most important is that, uh, and I think this is really the main point of this approach. If you ask yourself uh, how this is different to solving basically or using a solver, uh, in fact, is that using convolutional neural network has some memory capability. So, which means that all the trainings that we do, uh, then that's something we may reuse afterwards. So this is something that uh, that can reduce the amount of computation we may have to do later on. So I will explain what I'm what I mean with this memory capability after. I just want to show that uh, uh, an example of a fidelity result. If I would just use uh, a normal solver, so here I'm solving, I'm showing the velocity field of uh, Alec Glacier, just one snapshot. Uh, which is more or less realistic. And this is the one that I would obtain by traditional solver solving. And this is the one I would obtain by uh, using this emulated, this emulator, which is trained with this neural network. And as you can see, uh, we get the capability to approximate uh, ice flow solution very, very accurately using this uh, convolutional neural networks. Uh, so the fidelity is not really the problem. It's more like now the cost we have invest to invest to, to, um, to do the retraining, which really matters because that's what we want to mitigate. And to show the this uh, memory capability, I'm going to do a simple experiment. So this experiment is basically, I take, hopefully it's not, it doesn't crash. So I take a, a glacier that I like. This is the LH glacier in Switzerland. I, I play the gain of just uh, rising and decreasing this equilibrium line altitude where I just play the gain of 
having the glaciers that increase and decrease and increase and increase. Just again, it's just an, a modeling experiment. So why am I doing this? So here, this is my forcing. So this ELA that uh, go up and go down. And the reason why I'm doing this experiment is that in the first stage, what am I going to do is that I'm going to do some uh, intense retraining, which means at each iteration, I do retrain my convolutional neural network. And by doing this, as you can see, I get the error that uh, is between the error between the emulation and the solving is very low, which is not surprising because I invest some time in the training. And then after doing one pass, I just play the game of releasing the training. So if I release the training, then you will not be surprised that the error is going up. But the main advantage is that, if you, as you can see, is that I could still continue with a very light retraining. So which means, sorry, if I still continue with a, a retraining H10 iteration, that I could maintain the error very low, uh, while so I could maintain a very high accuracy at rather small computational effort. And this, the, and the reason is that because the CNN has learned this uh, during the first pass, basically, so we would not have that this this basically this result without having to do the, the first um, the, the first pass. Okay, I think I will skip this slide. Uh, here, what I wanted to summarize, I'll not, I will not go into the detail, but uh, in fact, the approach that I'm showing is, is really a, uh, could be seen as a merging point between kind of traditional numerics where we do some finite elements and uh, with machine learning. And in fact, this has some name in the literature and the literature is very recent. Uh, some people call it deep reads or variational for uh, physics informed neural network. So actually, it's not easy to find uh, the name of this because all the literature on this is extremely recent, uh, at least when I did this, uh, which was about a year ago. Um, okay, I just want to check the time. Uh, that I'm not completely off uh, time-wise. Okay, good. Okay, I would like to talk quickly about um, inverse modeling because inverse modeling is something that is uh, very important for uh, in glacier modeling. So the inverse modeling, or we could call this also data simulation, is when basically we 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 have to initialize um, initialize uh, simulations. So Typically, if we think that uh, we would like to model uh, glaciers that we like in the next uh, 80,000 years until 2100, so the first thing that any modeler has to do is, first of all, to estimate some parameters which are not observable. So they are the red parameters. Uh, in order to fit some uh, parameters which are observable, which are blue here. So basically, we may we can observe some ice surface velocities, we can observe some ice thickness profile or some uh, surface elevation. And basically, the ice thickness is not something that we can observe everywhere or uh, some parameters which are uh, controlling the ice viscosity or the sliding velocity, this is things that we, we would like, to, we need to estimate, but then of course we don't have an access. And this inverse modeling is really, uh, it's all about trying to find this uh, ice thickness or sliding parameters such that the emulated ice flow fit as much as, as well as possible these this blue variables. And, uh, and this is really a, a very important advantage of this convolutional network because uh, it has First of all, it can accelerate the optimization, uh, the, 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 the optimization, the, the wall optimization process uh, significantly compared to traditional method. And on the other hand, uh, it can really take advantage of machine learning machineries. When I say machine learning machineries, it's basically automatic differentiation to do the inversions. And I'm going to explain this in another slide. Uh, Basically, what I've been presenting so far uh, was the, the first upper part of this slide. So we have been forcing the physics uh, by minimizing, by finding the weight of the neural network, which we're minimizing. So here in the first approach, it was minimizing the misfit to some uh, data which was computed externally, but then you could replace this by uh, physical energy. That's something you can do. So this was a way to force the physics into the system. And now we could uh, actually use all the same methodology for forcing the observation. Uh, 
And the obsourcing observation, it is about to invert or to try to find what are the inputs such that we are minimizing the misfit to some data. And as you can see, enforcing the physics or enforcing the observation is done in a very similar manner because at the end, it ends up with solving an optimization problem. And that's, to me, I think that's kind of the beauty of uh, basically using convolutional neural network or artificial neural network instead of uh, or to replace the physical model by a convolutional neural network emulator is that actually the two operation which is enforcing the physics or enforcing the observation is now uh, based on very similar methodology which is and in fact all the the tools that we have been using for enforcing the physics we can reuse them for the enforcing the observations and uh, practically speaking if you look at the code in fact this will this will look very similar. Uh, I just show very uh, simple examples. So I don't show all the data. I assume that we, we are seeking for the eye sickness or this uh, red variable, which uh, produce the velocity on the surface that we observe, because now we have a pretty impressive uh, map of uh, observed surface velocity uh, worldwide. So I'm thinking about several projects like ITS Live or uh, the recent paper by Roma Milan uh, from last year, from this year. And uh, the data assimilation here consists of finding the eye sickness so that the, ice the eye emulated ice flow, so which means the image of the convolutional network uh, fit as good as possible the observed surface velocities. And the main advantage again of having this in form of a convolutional network is that we don't only have the model once it is trained, but we also have all the gradients. And all the gradients are extremely uh, useful because that's what exactly what we need if we want to do this optimization process where we we start from a first H0, we first start with the first eye sickness, we get a first uh, velocity which will have a certain bias and we want to correct to find the new eye sickness so that we reduce this bias. And to get this new eye sickness, we absolutely need the gradient of this misfit function. And this gradient come actually for free uh, because all the operations that we are doing, and again, I'm using the TensorFlow library, which means that all operations from the eye thickness to this misfit will be TensorFlow operations, and then I can use all this machinery, all the optimizers that are that are coming with this with this library, which makes that technically speaking, practically speaking, this 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 optimization is rather is not that difficult. Um, we could go for something more generic, uh, which means that we can add a number of certain number of control. Now we don't want to optimize only the eye sickness, but we want to have to optimize some ice flow parameters. And then we have some more observation, but all of this, all what I've been describing still apply. And then we can do some multivariable uh, optimization. And um, again, so if we were doing if we were doing this with a physical model, that's the the tricky and computationally expensive part is to compute the descent directions with especially using these adjoint problems because that's uh, what we do in general. And instead, we use this deep learning surrogate model and the uh, uh, descent direction, as I said before, are kind of found by uh, AD by automatic differentiation, and this is uh, technically very simple and computation computationally inexpensive. Okay, I just sort of illustrate an example of inversion here on the Rhone or alleged class here. You can see uh, our observations. You can see some lines here where we have some profile where we know the ice sickness. We could also see the observed ice velocities. And then uh, there is they are basically the data we want to fit. And what you can see here is a progression of the optimization through the iteration. So basically we start from here, we start from zero ice and then we converge to, towards something. And then what you see here, this is the eye sickness that we obtain at, at convergence. So, and of course the STD, the misfit to the observed velocity on the surface is reduced and finally get to a small numbers such that we are happy it, it fits the data well and also for the sorry that was for eye sickness and also for the observed velocities uh, uh, std is dropping and um, uh, again just to illustrate how efficient it is so this is something that took about one one minute on my laptop on the gpu and my laptop so this was uh it's really really not uh something uh completely very demanding as as long as we have a good gpu okay 
I just check the time that I have. I did, okay, I see that I still have another 10 minutes. I would like to give an overview of IGM and then hopefully to, to make a small demo. Um, practically speaking, IGM, so it's a 3D glacier evolution model, so it's written in TensorFlow Python, and uh, it has compatibility with all the libraries, uh, especially OGGM, uh, that I like a lot, especially because there are uh, many, many tools which are already uh, included in OGGM, uh, especially for uh, data handling. Uh, it has a model-wise structure, uh, especially to facilitate coupling and customization. And then uh, here, I think I will try to do some parallel with CSDMS. Um, so it is based on high order 3D ice flow model. And there is also basically all those components. Uh, I did not detail this, but there is also a model for high entalpy. So which means there is not only the mechanical model, but also the thermic part of the model. So IGM is a truly thermomechanical model in the sense that we have uh, this enthalpy, it's actually temperature and water content, and the two, the temperature affects the dynamic and the dynamic affects the temperature and the water content. There is a very, very small, very minimal uh, supplicial hydrological um, model as well. But then this is basically the main picture. Uh, well, it is computationally efficient, especially on GPU and all the, the main philosophy of IGM is that it is vectorial, at least in the horizontal direction. So all operations that we do in the horizontal direction, which is the one that is supposed to be the, the longest one, that because we 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 would like to to treat some very some some large arrays, assuming that we we want to model some large areas or with high resolution, especially if we want to if we have if we are dealing with complex topography. Um, we it, in, it take advantage of all automatic differentiation, which is facilitate inversion and data assimilation. And as I said before, as I'm using this convolutional neural network, so all the data actually live on 2D raster grid. Um, so I'm not doing any uh, um, irregular grid. So this is this remains rather simple. So everything is on the GitHub repository, the documentation, the code uh, example. Uh, for installing, we can also do it over PyPy uh, or through GitHub, but then it's probably better to do it over GitHub because the, change, the code changed quite uh, a lot. So there are a lot of updates. Uh, so in general, it's rather the, the, the installation is should be rather simple. The only things which is usually a bit more tricky is to install GPU drivers and then to get all the, the compatibility with the GPU. And this is also pretty OS dependent as well, but there are a lot of things which are written on the Viki. Um, now that's something also I would like to detail a bit. And that's, I think also very similar to the CSDMS framework. Uh, so actually I was uh, very interested to when I, I went through the CDMS paper, uh, I found quite a lot of inspiration to sort of model IGM because what IGM is doing, actually 99% of the code is actually uh, our modules. So only the, the core part of IGM is like a, a, an empty shell. And they are all modules and they are modules for a bit of everything. They are pre-processing modules, which for instance, there is an OGGM shop module, which uh, download the data, which set all the data that we want given an RGI ID of a glacier, or we can read some data. We can do this optimization step. The, what I described is inverse modeling. Then there are pre-processing modules, which are basically there are one module per physical component, one that computes the ice flow with this neural network emulator. Uh, another one taking care of climate that produce climate, another one that produce surface mass balance, and so on. And all of them basically they work together and some other for post-processing, which means that a module itself is uh, one Python function. It's one Python file, which include some um, functions for parameters, one for initializing, one for updating, and one for finalizing. So this is uh, how it is very, very similar to the uh, CSDMS framework. Um, IGM comes with some existing module, but uh, user can write their own. And that's actually not very difficult. Um, Okay, now I will switch to my terminal. So I prepared everything, but I, as I had to reboot uh, everything. But before 
uh, before to go. Okay, sorry, it will. It should not take me too long. Uh, did anyone write in the chat uh, an AGI ID that uh, we can try? I'm looking at. Okay, I'm checking. No, there is no suggestion. So what I'm going to do is that I will take. Um, we can go together to the glimpse map. If someone has a spontaneous idea of a glacier that he likes, we can say this now. Otherwise, I will pick a glacier. I mean, uh, I, I've yeah. asked you about the yes. Argentière before, right? Argentière. Let's go to Argentière. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, the Thanks. reason that I asked maybe like to like um, talk the other people through is there is like a um, an subglacial observatory there. I see. Okay. Um, so. Perfect. Then I take the RGI of uh, Argentière here, and basically what? So I will just activate. So I'm not going to install IGM right away. So I kind of I'm a bit cheating. So here I'm already on the IGM environment. So in the Python IGM environment, so everything is installed. So all that I'm going to do is IGM run, and plus I will uh, add uh, OGGM just one option RGI ID with this sorry okay can you see my screen well yep we can mm. okay perfect okay now it's running basically um and i will show you right after what is this here okay you can see the argentia glacier here uh, I did a simulation from 17,000 to uh, 2,000. As the glacier is rather small because it's 100 meters resolution, so it's uh, very actually uh, pretty quick. Uh, so the glacier I selected before was slightly longer. But what you can see basically is how the glacier reacts to the certain climate, which is prescribed here. And on the top of this, I also played a game of just doing some seeding so that we can see uh, the trajectory of some particles. And actually, what is nice here, we could see some almost sort of uh, a little ice age moraine. Now there is a tool where I can take this, uh, this and put it in the browser. Uh, what is nice is that someone from the community make a nice tool with a browser to directly visualize the result of the simulation. And you can see here the Argentia Glacier and we can play the movie here. So we can see the animation and then the velocities as well. That's pretty awesome too. Yeah. I uh, yeah, absolutely, and I I was very impressed. This person did it uh, very quickly, and uh, we have we are really thinking about doing a bit, a bit more generic tool where we can have way more control and then analyze all the simulation. I find it's very very uh, handy to have it over the browser, <laughs> uh, because then you don't really need much tools yourself installed. And I think this it works across platform as well. Um, yeah. So basically, it looks like this. Now I just want to show what I did. So it created a lot of files, but before to start, there were only one file. So I will clean my my room. <laughs> so when I arrive, there were only this. Sorry. Uh, when I arrived, there were only one file. There were a parameter file, and then we will just look at what what is here. So in this parameter file, basically what I say is that I'm calling this uh, module. So I call the pre-processing module or DGM shop. That's the one that when I gave this RGI ID, so it's just downloaded all the data that I wanted for this uh, for this run. And then it calls a certain number of module. One is uh, using, one is generating uh, a climate. So this is actually uh, also supported by OGGM and one is computing the surface mass balance from the climate also with parameters uh, calibrated by OGGM. Then uh, this is a module which computes the ice flow, the ones that update the time, the one that updates the thickness and the one that computes the particles. So they are basically my 
processing modules, and there are some post-processing modules which uh, write in CDF to the live plot, or this is the one that is uh, permit to, to show this uh, visualization over the browser. And of course, there are, here you can change a couple of parameters that say from when you want to do the simulation until when. Uh, so this is basically the way how we control the climate. So because we actually the climate, this is historical data, but then we may want to apply some shift, like some delta temperature, if we want to make the, cli the climate cooler or warmer. Uh, so here, for instance, applying a plus four degree by 2000, uh, 2100 or plus plus eight in the case of extreme scenarios. And then of course we can change all our parameters here. And basically what IGM run, when I do IGM run here, uh, when I do this, sorry, it was here. When I do this IGM run, so it will call all those modules in, the, in turn and then it will loop over all the module, it will initialize all the take the parameters, initialize all the module, and then within a time loop, it will update all, all the model components. And finally, for the post-processing, it will finalize. Um, yeah, so I think I will stop here. Uh, so basically, uh, all the code, the documentation is on the GitHub repo. We also have a Discord chat for um, for um, to, to, to help the community to to, to, to discuss or uh, to, to get some support. Uh, also, there is a video tutorial which is ready and then there are some reference. And thanks a lot. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions.